broadcasting now. Okay, gentlemen, you want to make sure that you're muted yourself and let uh, Dr. Hess is going to take the helm and you're live and recording. All right, welcome. Uh, we uh, have opened up our webinar uh, for Terry Harris, Returning to Work and Infection Control Checklist. Uh, much earlier than some of our previous webinars, we have over 5,000 people registered today. So fingers crossed that our Zoom account can handle this load. Uh, for those of you that uh, have friends that were not able to register for this event, uh, this is being recorded uh, and you will be, they'll be able to watch the webinar in probably four or five hours on YouTube at Washington Academy of General Dentistry. Um, also, we're attempting to broadcast live on YouTube. So you could text your uh, colleagues and let them also know that if they go to YouTube, Washington Academy of General Dentistry, there is a chance they'll be able to see Terry live right now. Unfortunately, you, um, they will not be able to see, receive CE credit um, for the, um, today's webinar. Um, in regards to CE credit, CE credit will be issued through the University of Washington School of Dentistry CE program, and that should show up in your email box within the next couple of days. Um, for those of you that are AGD members, uh, your CE credit will be uh, sent to the AGD automatically, and that'll show up on your AGD transcript within two to four weeks. All righty, right now I'm attempting to share our uh, page with our upcoming events, and that stalled out on us, so we're going to restart that and see if we can uh, get that to roll here as people are coming in. We've got a lot of time before Terry comes on, so please take a look at all the webinars that we have coming up. You'll see there's QR codes uh, in these flyers. You can use your phone to register uh, or go to WashingtonAGD.org. Keep in mind this is free CE being brought to you by the Washington Academy of General Dentistry Stay Home Stay Healthy CE series. You'll notice we have a couple of speakers uh, like uh, Dr. Nash uh, that spoke yesterday. That's just a reminder of who we've had on and uh, that you can see those webinars at YouTube at Washington Academy of General Dentistry. Today, after Terry, we've got a great lineup. We've got Penny Reed, and she'll be talking about driving case acceptance. Be more like Disney and less like the IRS. After that is Dr. Roy Shelburne, and this is really a fun lecture. Do dentistry, not prison time. Clinical records prevent criminal records. Uh, it's, it's a really, really fun lecture. I think it's a great one for uh, staff and dentists to see. Tomorrow we continue with uh, Dr. Michael Melkers and then with uh, Dr. Bethany Velacci. Uh, Dr. Yassine has his implant study club that's continuing part three uh, with Dr. Catafucci. So look forward to seeing him. And on Thursday, Dr. Ann is going to give a lecture on intraoral scanning after we have our Omni Leadership Through Crisis uh, uh, series that's continuing. For those of you that um, saw um, uh, Michael Fling last week, he was supposed to be on on Monday. He had to reschedule because he uh, was stuck somewhere in Oklahoma there, but he's going to be uh, continuing his uh, lecture on Thursday the shell technique to provisionalize and phase complex restorative cases. Uh, next week, kind of fun, we have our International Academy in Nathology Day. We've got uh, Bill Robbins, Neil Grissetto, and Thomas Giblin that are going to be speaking, so that's a, a good lineup. And then on Tuesday, we roll into our Arkansas AGD uh, Day, and thank you to Dr. Kent Ross uh, from the Arkansas AGD for putting together uh, Dr. Rick Robley, James Metz, 
and Bernie Villadego. So looking forward to that. Then we roll into Wednesday where the Braves are back and they're going to be looking at uh, PPA loans, unemployment, COVID-19 safety for you and your patients. Um, found out that uh, Terry Harris is going to plan on being with us next Wednesday, May 6th from 2.30 to 4.30. And so if you have any questions for Terry, could you please uh, send those to agd-covid at harrisbiomedical.net. And when uh, Terry's flyer goes by again, you'll see that uh, email address to be able to send questions in. And we'll put that in the chat box over on the right-hand side. So you don't need to ask in the Q&A um, for that email address again. Today, we will not be taking questions. Those questions, uh, Doc, uh, Terry has received over 50 questions from registrants. He's uh, categorized them and he will be addressing those uh, uh, during his presentation and at the end. If you do happen to type a question in the Q&A, uh, you can also upvote that. Your thumbs up will uh, make that higher priority. And if there happens to be some time at the end, we will attempt to uh, address those Q&A. But we only have till 1130 today, so an hour and a half. Uh, next Wednesday, we have uh, two hours with Terry, so uh, keep that in mind. And again, that email address is agd-covid at Harris Biomedical dot net and that's all one word well we've got lots of time before our presentation <laughs> how do i mute hmm okay all righty uh we had a question about muting i'm not sure uh, i think you go over on the lower left hand side of your zoom app there's a microphone there and you click on that to mute yourself. Uh, they are auto muted also. Okay, Dr. perfect, Hassan. thank you. So for those of you that are new to Zoom, uh, please play around with the interface. You can't hurt it. You can bring the speakers in. The uh, Terry's not going to have a webcam on him today, so uh, that's not a big uh, deal, uh, but there's, there's different views there feel free to play around with it. You're not gonna hurt that uh, Zoom application. Uh, for some of you, you may need to update your Zoom um, application. So try and do that as quick as you can. We've got about 10 minutes till we're gonna kick this off. Uh, and as you can see, today's course is full. So really uh, nice to, to see we've got such good attendance uh, for today's course. We will not be using the raise hand feature today. So thank you, uh, I, unless, no, we probably won't be using it. Uh, so uh, there's no need to raise your hand. Um, we're gonna just start this PowerPoint again, since it's stalled out and continue showing you what's available uh, today and next week with upcoming courses. So. Yes, Terry Harris is here today. Uh, right after Terry, we've got Penny Reed. Uh, she's going to be talking about driving case acceptance. And then after Penny, we've got uh, Dr. Roy Shelburne speaking on doing dentistry, not prison time. It's a fun presentation uh, and it's worth seeing. Uh, CE credits, please do not email the Washington Academy of General Dentistry asking about CE credits. Your CE credits will be coming from the University of Washington School of Dentistry CE department. Those should show up in your email um, with the email that you registered for this course within two to three days. For those of you that are AGD members, you can uh, just sit back. We're going to submit your AGD CE credits directly to the AGD, and those should show up on your transcript within two to four weeks. Okay, so just be patient with that. 
Uh, for those of you that are uh, have friends that were not able to register for today's webinar and wonder if they can get CE credit uh, by watching on YouTube, they cannot. We cannot issue CE credit for watching our webinars uh, via uh, YouTube. In the future, we might have on demand, but we don't have that at this point. Um, just want to thank all our sponsors, um, the Washington Academy of General Dentistry, the WAGD Stay Home, Stay Healthy CE series, and our co-sponsors include Seattle King County Dental Society, Pierce County Dental Society, and Snohomish County Dental Society. We'd also like to thank our friends at Comet USA and Patterson Dental. A uh, big thank you to the Canadian Academy of Restorative Dentistry and Prostodontics for putting together Card P Day next Thursday. Looking forward to our speakers from Canada. Uh, we've got uh, Mark Douglas, Kim Parlett, and Ian Tester. So that should be a good lineup. Ah, also Friday, May 8th. Minu Karbash, Dr. Karbash, uh, periodontist from our area, is going to be speaking on COVID-19, getting ready for practice, evolving systems. So mark that on your calendar. Um, we've got over 1,200 people that have come into the webinar so far. We're going to wait until 10 o'clock uh, to bring Terry on, just to allow uh, everybody the opportunity to get into the webinar. We have about uh, 90 minutes with Terry today. Questions have been submitted uh, to the email address of agd.covid at harrisbiomedical.net, and we'll be taking those questions um, that uh, Terry has received. Uh, there is a chance we might address some questions at the very end, but that is highly unlikely given that we have 5,000 people registered on this webinar today. Uh, QR codes are available on the flyers you see going by. Use those QR codes to register for upcoming events. If you use that QR code, um, that will take you to the registration site. If that doesn't work for you, you can use www.washingtonagd.org. Go to the website and scroll down through the free webinar course offerings. Like to emphasize that this is free CE for all dentists, hygienists, assistants, uh, front desk, anybody that wants to attend. You do not need to be an AGD member. We encourage you to be an AGD member, but you do not need to be an AGD member. Um, the speakers, every single one of our speakers on this webinar series have donated their time. There's no honorariums being paid, which is good because the Washington Academy of General Dentistry, our funds are in lockdown right now with all the uh, COVID-19 pandemic stuff. So we really appreciate our speakers for donating their time. Um, we've got a great lineup. Thank you to all the uh, partner organizations that have supported us. And uh, we have another 21 webinars lined up between now and May 18th. Um, so I think we've already done 20 some. And if you go to YouTube, Washington AGD uh, or Washington Academy of General Dentistry, you'll be able to view those webinars on uh, YouTube. Unfortunately, you will not be able to get CE credit for watching those webinars via YouTube. We'll just uh, give it a few more minutes here. Um, let those that uh, saw the start time of 10 o'clock continue to trickle in. And I'll just take a break here to look and see what kind of Q&A we have here. So Dr. Jacobs, you've 
put in here, I have a password for the course on infection control with Terry Harris, but cannot sign in anywhere. I get a message, the course is full, the course is full, uh, but you're logged into the webinar for that course right now, if that's the one you were looking for. So uh, the, the webinar has not started yet. That's, so you've typed in the Q&A, you are in there. All righty. Let's take a look at our numbers. Uh, we're up to over 2,000 people logged in. That's pretty good since uh, the, uh, we're not using the raise hand feature. So uh, Dr. Westby, you know, go ahead and lower your hand. Uh, thank you for joining us. Welcome to the Washington Academy of General Dentistry Stay Home, Stay Healthy CE series. This is being brought to you by the Washington Academy of General Dentistry. And it's being brought to you by University of Washington School of Dentistry, CE, uh, as well as Seattle King County Dental Society, Pierce County Dental Society, and Snohomish County Dental Society, as well as the Canadian Academy of Restorative Dentistry and Prostodontics. We also have some support from Comet USA and Patterson Dental. So thank you for everybody that's jumped on board. We'd like to thank also the International Academy of Nathology and Arkansas Academy of General Dentistry for their support. Welcome to all the AGD members in California that are joining us, Texas and Nebraska, and I believe we have a strong contingent from Minnesota as well. So uh, let's see what numbers, okay, we're at about 2,500 so far. Uh, we've got a couple of minutes to go before Terry's back on. And once again, our PowerPoint froze up, so we'll restart that. And I don't know why it's given us so much trouble here today, but it is. All righty. So if you're just joining us, yes, you have logged into Terry Harris's webinar, Returning to Work, an Infection Control Checklist. Uh, today, we will be going through the Q&A, the uh, questions that you've, those of you that registered, uh, were able to send questions to Terry at agd.covid at harrisbiomedical.net. So uh, Terry's broken up those uh, 60 or so questions into 17 categories. He'll be addressing those as best he can. We probably won't be using the Q&A feature here uh, just based on the number of questions that he already has, but feel free to type something in there. And if we have time at the end, uh, we'll try to get to it. Uh, for those of you that want to view this webinar again after the fact, you can go to YouTube, Washington Academy of General Dentistry. Um, we have been bringing um, CE webinars to uh, dentists, hygienists, assistant front desk here now for the last couple of weeks. Um, and so if you missed any of those, you can go to YouTube to see those. Uh, you'll see we've got a great lineup of speakers um, for the next couple of weeks here. Uh, and after this webinar today, we've got Penny Reed, who's going to be talking about driving case acceptance, be more like Disney and less like the IRS. And that's going to start at noon. So uh, Terry's going to finish at about 1130. It'll give you a chance to grab a quick snack or something and get back and join us with Penny. And then this afternoon at 230, we have uh, Dr. Roy Shelburne. He's got a really fun lecture called Do Dentistry Not Prison Time? Clinical Records Prevent Criminal Records. Records. So uh, I've seen part of this before and it, it's a lot of fun. Uh, Dr. Shelburne spent time in jail and it's quite the story. Um, if you want to register for anything that's coming by on the flyers there, please use the QR codes. If that QR code doesn't work for you, please go to WashingtonAGD.org and you'll be able to look through at our list of uh, CE offerings. The vast majority of those offerings are webinars, free webinars right now uh, that we're delivering over the, the next couple of weeks. So we, we want to thank you for joining us. We're just past the hour here and so we're going to wait. Uh, we've got over 3,000 people 
uh, in the webinar so far. We've had 5,000 registers, so we'll just give a couple of minutes here before we switch over uh, to Terry Harris. Do you, yes, for those of you that have just come in, this is Terry Harris from Harris Biomedical. Um, today's webinar is entitled Returning to Work, an Infection Control Checklist. So I uh, really appreciate Terry donating his time and all the work he's put into this webinar prior to uh, today. Uh, he's fielded a ton of emails. I believe he said he had 60 different uh, emails that came in. And the questions all kind of boil down into uh, about 17 categories, he said. So he'll be going through there those uh, today. We probably won't have a, a time for you to ask questions, but feel free to type them in the Q&A box, not the chat window. And if you do that, we'll see if we have any time at the very end. So welcome. Welcome to the Washington Academy of General Dentistry Stay Home, Stay Healthy CE Series. This CE Series is being brought to you by the University of Washington School of Dentistry CE Department, brought to you by the Canadian Academy of Restorative Dentistry and Prosthodontics, Comet USA, Patterson Dental, and the Seattle King County Dental Society, Pierce County Dental Society, and Snohomish County Dental Society. You will be receiving CE credit emailed to the email address you registered with. Please do not send an email to the Washington Academy of General Dentistry asking when your CE will be available. It will come in the next two to three days from the University of Washington School of Dentistry. And for those of you that are AGD members, we will be reporting your AGD uh, CE credit directly to the AGD. So it'll go on your transcript in two to four weeks. Things are really backlogged. And so you're not going to see that instantly. Um, if for some reason you haven't been receiving emails regarding this series, you can take a look at the University of Washington CE uh, website. Uh, you can also email your director, whether it be uh, from Pierce, Snohomish, or Seattle King County, asking for uh, an updated uh, list of the webinars that are going to occur. Past webinars are on YouTube at Washington Academy of General Dentistry. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot give you CE credit for those uh, uh, watching those webinars. Uh, just heard today that uh, Mr. Terry Harris has agreed to do another webinar for us, and that will be May 6th, and it will be from 2.30 to 4.30. So if you have any questions uh, for Terry, uh, and the flyer's coming up here with the um, email address, you can send those to agd-covid at harrisbiomedical.com net. And he will attempt to do the same thing that he's doing today, uh, put together a, a lecture, uh, and then address those questions that you have. So with that, uh, we're five minutes in. It's time to start the webinar. Terry, I'm going to stop sharing here. And go ahead and please share your screen. Are you there? We're here, Terry. Thank you. And I hope you, you can see the screen, right? Well, uh, not yet. Uh, you go, go ahead and share your PowerPoint there. Should be there by now. It's there. Thank you, Terry. I'm going to mute myself. And again, uh, you know, thank you for doing this. I think you really know, need no introduction to all the people you've worked with over the years here in Washington State and other states. So thank you for being such a great partner to the Washington Academy of General Dentistry. We thank Harris Biomedical for all the courses that you've provided to our uh, participants over the years. And uh, uh, just keep doing what you're doing. We appreciate it. Well, thank you, Doctor. I appreciate the opportunity. And I really do appreciate the uh, uh, partnership that we have in working with AGD for all of these years, as well as the clients that we work with. As you can see by that picture, I'm getting much older than the years <laughs> when we started, uh, but I really do appreciate uh, everybody that's chipping in today. Uh, and again, uh, one of the things that we can tell you is that if you do have questions, 
that you'd like to forward either during this presentation or after. You can go to the agd-covid at harrisbiomedical.net uh, and uh, we will respond to those uh, either today if we have a little bit of time, but surely by next week and uh, during the week as well. The program we're going to be talking about, I won't go item by item on this to explain what it is because these are all of the issues that we're talking about on kind of a work uh, uh, checklist. And I will tell you now that uh, we have uh, provided or prepared an actual single page uh, work list that, cover, that will cover all of the stuff that we're talking about in a, a checklist kind of format. And anybody that wants to have a copy of that uh, checklist, uh, as opposed to the entire uh, presentation here, I just send a, a request again uh, to agd-covid uh, at Harris Biomedical, and we'll make sure that we can email those things out to you. One of the things that we do, I think is it's really important to understand, is that we don't provide opinions uh, or ideas or thoughts uh, when we're talking about something as serious as this. Uh, so we use the sources uh, that uh, actually are calling the shots and, and guiding line during this uh, COVID period. Uh, and for us, uh, that in this state of Washington is certainly WISHA, of course, and I'll explain this a bit uh, to those who don't understand WISHA. WISHA is a Washington Industrial Safety and Health Act. In Washington, that's the equivalent of OSHA. Uh, and that is the uh, uh, primary uh, health safety kind of organization or ag agency in the state of Washington. Also, the CDC obviously is providing uh, guidelines and recommendations uh, during this time as they do across the board all the time. Uh, and the uh, real issue, of course, that we deal with as it relates to infection control uh, is the Dental Quality Assurance Commission. Uh, and uh, between those three, uh, we have the program that we're going to uh, talk about today. And when we're talking about it, we, talk, we call those people the rule makers. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that's on the internet, uh, in the media, uh, over telephone conversations that just flat isn't true or factual. Uh, and is scaring the liver out of a whole lot of people in our industry. So what we've done is collected the information and we get the information to you today from the people who are the rule makers that we talk about. In particular, WISHA, uh, and, they, and they are dedicated to employee safety. And you can see by the line on the bottom that the, the, the same mandate that OSHA has, WISHA has. And so what OSHA decides at the federal level, WISHA in Washington, has to adopt. Now they can't make that less restrictive, uh, but they can, if they choose, make it more restrictive. At this time, uh, the OSHA position is to pretty much defer to the CDC, and we'll get to that as well. They do have the bloodborne pathogen, of course, and the bloodborne pathogen is the adopted version of the method by which employers are supposed to, uh, uh, under the law, uh, protect the environment and the workers that work with them. Uh, and even though the WISHA program bloodborne pathogen standard was talking about bloodborne uh, exposure, uh, it, it from the very start is written to protect all employees from all infectious uh, exposures that they might run into. The CDC, of course, is to protect the American uh, people from, and this is their mission statement, uh, from healthy, from health, safety, and security threats. Uh, not only in this country, but throughout the United States. And then the Dental Quality Assurance Commission, we'll talk about in a second. The CDC actually adopted the guidelines for infection control in the dental health care setting back in 2003. And it was that point that we started writing infection control programs for, for our clients. And then again, in 2016, uh, they put out kind of a supplemental uh, publication uh, that was called the Summary of Infection Prevention practices in dental setting and basic expectations for safe care. Between the two of those, the Dental Quality Assurance Commission uh, has, that's basically the rules or the, the agency in the state of Washington that's set up to protect the health and safety uh, of the people of the state of Washington by making sure that the, the dentists are competent and, and they have a high quality health care. Uh, those are the three rule makers that we are using as the basic uh, basis of this particular uh, uh, presentation. 
and the DQAC uh, Infection Control Committee was set up uh, almost four years ago uh, to uh, establish the infection control rules uh, in the state of Washington, and they are in the process of being approved, and we'll talk about that schedule uh, a little bit later. So to break it down by the individual entity, you can see here that WISHA uh, is responsible for employee safety. Uh, CDC uh, doesn't have the authority of law. It makes recommendations and establishes gold lines, or, or, or pardon me, uh, 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 guidelines for infection control throughout the United States. And then those guidelines are adopted uh, by uh, the uh, Dental Quality Assurance Commission and the various dental boards across the United States. What we call the advocates uh, in the state of Washington are, of course, the AGD uh, and the Washington State Dental Association. Uh, the mission of the Dental Association is to make sure that the dentists, uh, uh, or actually it empowers its members to advocate for optimal health care. And the AGD mandate, because this is uh, within the government of the state of Washington, is to serve as an advocate for the general dentist to promote improved delivery of patient care, and of course to uh, increase public awareness of the quality of dentistry. And one of the things that we'll talk about a little later uh, is how to uh, approach your patients when they do come back uh, and make uh, them comfortable as they walk into the office and provide the care uh, that they have. So with that, just real briefly, uh, when I talk about the infection control rules in the state of Washington, uh, since mid-2016, actually just uh, shortly after uh, the second publication by the CDC, the summary uh, publication, an infection control committee was set up in the state of Washington, and it's been having meetings on a very, very regular basis since that time. Uh, and on the 6th of March, uh, that proposed language was uh, presented to the commission. Uh, it was approved for the process uh, to ultimately become a law in the state of Washington. And whoops, just uh, let me go back here a second. Uh, and uh, the time frame that we're talking about is going to include uh, those items that you see right there. And we are going to talk about all of those items today because they are identical to uh, the CDC regulations, or pardon me, recommendations that are put out. The, the uh, program in terms of the process of ultimately being adopted and when it's going to be effective, uh, see, you can write here. Uh, the uh, uh, commission approved, as I said, on the 6th of March, and it went into the process, and they expect to have a public hearing on it uh, on October 23rd, and if that's adopted, it goes into what is called a CR 103, and that's a process that it has to go through the health department and ultimately become law. Uh, that takes roughly four to six weeks, and so if everything goes as expected, and if there isn't another holdup, the law itself will become effective, the infection control rules in the state of Washington uh, by roughly the first quarter of 2021. There are two primary elements in that that won't be effective uh, individually until uh, later. Uh, the water, water line testing part of it won't be effective until 2021 in December, and then the requirement to sterilize the slow speed handpiece motors uh, won't be uh, effective until August of 2022. So those are the, uh, the kind of what's happening here in the state of Washington. And as we go back to sources, one of the things that we really need everybody to understand, because we get a lot of questions saying, well, OSHA says we're going to have to do this, uh, and or we're going to have to do that. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, you have to remember that OSHA and WISHA apply to all of the industries, not just to dentistry. And so if there are certain things in the law that uh, don't apply to dentistry, obviously they don't apply to what we're talking about today. The CDC recommendations are specifically, when we're talking on today, are specifically for metal, uh, medical and the dental industry. And one of the things you also have to remember is the bloodborne pathogen standard and most of the CDC recommendations that you've been seeing are speaking both to the medical side and to the dental side. And there are a lot of things that you're reading and people are concerned about that will apply to the medical side in the clinics and the hospitals that absolutely wouldn't apply to the smaller dental uh, practices that we see. So the 2003 and the 2016 recommendations are just the dental industry. And that's what we're going to be talking about 
when we talk about reopening uh, the offices. First of all, it's important that we protect the employees. Uh, the training that is specific uh, to the COVID issue uh, is in the CDC guidelines. It's some of the things that we're going to be talking about today, but it's really important. Uh, from the practitioner side that everybody understands not only what the responsibilities are, but uh, the whole circus around responding to the public, the concerns that they have, the stuff they have to sift out from the media and a lot of misrepresentation uh, and let the staff know that they're on safe grounds as long as they follow the rules uh, and that they know how to deal uh, in the procedures. Make sure that as as much as you can, considering uh, that uh, PPE is really difficult to get hold of right now. It's being restocked, uh, but you need to wear personal protective equipment. Uh, and and that's, a, that's a basic requirement. You don't want to get involved with something uh, where you're going to put yourself at risk uh, and when you're trying to help other people as well. But make sure that the employee's health uh, is, uh, is good. And, and we'll talk in a minute about what steps you might want to take, uh, but it doesn't do anybody any good if the employees aren't well or are put at risk. And one of the questions you can ask, and this was something that was recommended by the CDC, is check with the staff and have they had their seasonal flu shots? Because there is evidence, according to the CDC, that the people with the flu shots have a just a little bit better likelihood of not being infected uh, if there is an exposure. When we talk about the things when you monitor the staff, uh, and this is something that staff members can do themselves, you know, check the, the fever uh, twice a day, once in the morning, once in the afternoon. Uh, if you have difficulties breathing uh, or uh, if you have coughing, you want to call a productive cough, those are the kind of things you really should be concerned about. And the bottom line is if you're not well, stay home. Uh, you don't have to, to, to be the, the great trooper and, and come in when you're ill, for no other reason that uh, that's going to be to your betterment of your health, but also you're not going to put anybody uh, else at, at risk. Also, because the uh, equipment uh, has been down, we assume that uh, you shut the stuff down and cleaned it out on the way out, uh, but a lot of people haven't. Make sure the amalgam separator, uh, you know, the dental unit water lines are clean. We're going to talk about that a little later. Uh, run spore tests on your sterilizers. Uh, they've been down and dead. Uh, for those offices that have been just shut down completely. And of course, if you've been working on uh, an emergency or urgent care basis only, uh, then your sport tests should have been run uh, on a weekly basis, just like uh, they always have been. And make sure again that any systems that you have that are shut down, uh, that are, are, are open back up. And then prepare the office. And these are things that you can do actually before the office is open. Uh, I'm sure most of you have an eye on the inventory of your supplies, uh, but if you don't, uh, if you've been closed down, go in uh, and check what you have uh, and figure out a way to, if, if there's a shortage, how to respond to that. Uh, there are guidelines on CDC as that as well. Uh, and obviously we can't get into all the details of all the issues that are out there, but we identify them like this. Make sure that the supplies are, uh, are sufficient and if they're not, uh, start talking to the suppliers, talking to people that can provide that for you, and talk to each other. Uh, because we've got a number of calls from docs that have told us, you know, I found a place where we can get stuff uh, and uh, talk to each other in the dental community. Uh, and that's a great uh, line to have a, a hand in and be involved in. Uh, secondly, remove what we call touchable items, you know, in the uh, reception area, uh, at least for the time being until we're back to as close as we get to normal, uh, the newspapers, the toys, uh, any of the things that people pick up, uh, pens, cups, the various things that uh, can transmit or carry the, the virus uh, and potentially infect somebody else. And then also post signs. We have a number of signs. We're going to show you a couple of today uh, that we've designed, including the one there at the bottom. Uh, you know, we have a sign that uh, you put on the door that says, you know, if you're not well, please go home, call back, reschedule. Those are the kind of things. Have, you know, the coughing, sneezing signs, not just in one place, but throughout the office that reminds not only the staff uh, of their responsibility and how to stay safe, but also uh, to your, your patients. Uh, it serves two purposes. One, it gives them an idea of how to keep themselves safe, but it also transmits the message 
that you in the office are, are concerned not only about your own health, uh, but, but their health as well. And the other kind of things that you can do is, is uh, as you see here, place uh, tissues out uh, if you can get uh, the supply. Uh, and this is when I say place them out, I'm talking about the reception area. If you get the supply, you know, hand disinfectant is really good in the bathrooms, put soap so they can use soap and water. Uh, clean all the counters that you have. Disinfect the areas uh, that might uh, uh, have been or will become contaminated during the course of any given day. And then down and below when we talked about social distancing, that certainly is person to person when possible, but also if you have the space in your in your reception area to uh, space the chairs far enough apart, and they're talking about a six feet uh, wingspan uh, on that. In terms of the operatories, you know, change the keyboard, uh, pardon me, cover the keyboard, and then change that between patients. Uh, and, and if you don't uh, have a, a clear cover to put that on, then disinfect the keyboard. This is one of the things that we see when we do facility reviews. The people kind of forget to do that in the hurry of everything. Uh, and uh, just make sure that anything that might come in contact is either barrier protected uh, or disinfected uh, and to very thoroughly, you know, before the patients come in and slash after the last patient left. Uh, if you have paper charts, put over some kind of a clear uh, cover on the patient chart uh, if, that, if you're still using paper charts uh, so that you can see what you have to see and also so it's not infected when it goes back out to the administrative staff uh, and put them at risk as well. Uh, limit access to the operatory. And this is one of the things we talked about a little bit uh, in-house, actually not a little bit, a lot in-house. And that basically says, uh, uh, if you can not have uh, the patient's uh, parents in there, if they're, if they're young, and not have family members in there, uh, it's better to ask them if they can, whether permitting sit in the car or at the very least in the reception area, uh, if you can keep the patients, you know, socially distanced uh, so that uh, uh, they're not uh, putting each other uh, at risk. Wear the personal, the complete personal protective a costume uh, when you're disinfecting the room. One of the things that we see, uh, and we do about 12 or 1400 facility reviews, audits of dental offices a year, is that people will not always wear the full complement of personal protective equipment when they break the room down. And while I can understand that, you've been chairside, you know, for an hour or whatever it is, uh, and it's fun to, to kind of peel down, but this is not the time. Uh, make sure that you wear it and keep yourself safe and disinfect after the procedure using standard precautions. Uh, and that includes meaning uh, that you use disinfectants that are EPA approved. We'll talk about that a little later, a little later as well. In terms of screening, we've broken it down into three kind of categories. Pre-scheduled -screen, pre screening, when you talk to them and in, in the process of scheduling appointments, uh, then once they come in, <clears throat> I beg your pardon, uh, for the procedure, and then after the procedure is done, roughly 24 to 48 hours after the time, and in terms of the pre-screening side of it, or pre-scheduling, uh, ask these questions, and, and I might also point out some of the doctors say, well, I, I feel a little uh, intrusive to ask some of these questions, but uh, these are questions that the public has been answering for years whether it's going into a hospital, whether it's going you know, into a, a flight and airlines that are asking questions. Uh, and if you don't ask the questions, uh, I can promise you the, the patient base is gonna ask, wonder why. But ask, have you had the symptoms of COVID? And, and most people know what those are. If you'd like to go over those and that, you know, the, 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 the chest uh, problems, the breathing and the, everything, if you wanna go into that, that is fine. Uh, have you had uh, or have, were you infected or are you infected at the time? Have you been in any area uh, that uh, is currently identified as active and spreading? Uh, as we know that there are, there are hot spots and there are areas that have hardly been hit uh, and you need to have that information. Have they been close contact with anybody that's been infected with COVID-19? And then the last one, ask about age. You know, do they have any autoimmune disorders? And another question you might ask that isn't on the list is ask them if they are in the health care field, uh, because obviously those are the people who are absolutely essential to what's going on, including everybody in this audience. 
uh, and they're the ones that are most at risk. And those are questions that we need to ask. And if there's a negative side on any of these, then you should really not consider or consider not uh, establishing an appointment, um, unless of course it's emergency uh, or urgent. Uh, then when the patient arrives, and, and there have been a couple of approaches to this, uh, and one is uh, should the people at the front desk uh, uh, do the, uh, uh, the check-in or do you want to take the patient directly from the car directly into the uh, operatory? And that's one of the things that we think works really well. But let your patients know when you're scheduling and then recheck again. Have them call from the car when they get there, assuming that they all have a phone. And when they get there, have them wait in the car until they're called in. Uh, and then uh, when they come in, then have a staff member meet them at the door, advise the family members to please remain in the car if that's at all possible, uh, and ask them to wear their own mask if they have one when they come in. And once they do, just have them follow uh, the staff member into the operatory. If that's not possible, then these are the kind of things you can go through with the exception of following into the operatory, uh, and you can ask the questions uh, that we're talking about uh, at the uh, uh, what we call the pre-procedure uh, part of it. And again, going over, do you have the symptoms? Were you infected? Have you been outside of the United States uh, in the last 14 days or in close contact with anybody infected or ill with COVID-19? Uh, and then in the, in the operatory, provide the patient with a mouthwash. And there have been a couple, three that have been, been uh, suggested. Uh, you can pick the one you prefer take the patient's temperature. And, and this is something, again, that people say, wow, I feel kind of, um, um, it, it bothers me to have to do that. Every time that I go to a physician, they take my temperature and weigh me. Frankly, I don't mind them taking my temperature. I don't look forward to stepping on the scale, but you don't have to have them do that. But if they do have the temperature that's over 100.4, let the doctor know if the doctor's not the one that's actually uh, taking uh, the temperature. And then also as part of that, educate your patients. Uh, there is a lot of stuff out in the media, especially when this thing first surfaced, when it appeared that the media wanted to pre present the absolute worst case scenario that they could. Uh, and they were talking about everybody dying and didn't talk a lot about the people that weren't and that weren't infected <clears throat> or who had recovered. Uh, but let them know with the signs, as I mentioned a little earlier, uh, that you're working to protect them. Provide a mask if they don't have one uh, when they come in, and, and, and I promise you they'll appreciate that. Explain the steps, your infection control steps. Explain to them the personal protective equipment you wear. Uh, when they're in the chair, explain that it was disinfected completely before they came in, and it's going to be disinfected uh, when, uh, when they leave. These are the kind of things uh, that um, are really important to kind of ease the uh, attitude or the concern of the patients. And it's, it's important to remember also when we talk about personal protective equipment that patients understand now more than they ever did uh, the value of personal protective equipment. Uh, and so when you explain that to them, it's, you're listening to an audience that isn't completely ignorant as they were say uh, when the bloodborne pathogen standard was adopted became effective back in 1992. When we talk about the various things that we have to do as kind of a checklist, we look, as I said earlier, uh, to the CDC for their guidance in this. Uh, OSHA at the federal level and WISHA in the state of Washington pretty much defers to the CDC. Uh, so they're the kind of things that uh, we are doing and, and being recommended that we do uh, are the things that keeps everybody safe. And one of the things uh, that uh, we talk about all the time in the bloodborne pathogen standard is a thing that's called the chain of infection. And it's basically the five conditions that have to be uh, in place uh, before infection is, is, uh, can take place. And even though normally we're talking about bloodborne pathogen, in this case, we're talking specifically about COVID-19. And, and if someone is going to be infected, often obviously the bug has to be there, the virus has to be there. And there also has to be a source. Somebody has to be carrying that from one place to another. And so if nobody's infected uh, and, and you're talking to somebody that's not infected, you're not going to be infected either. But if that person is infected with COVID, uh, then that's why we have 
uh, the, the uh, distancing between people. And that's why we're talking about wearing masks and so forth. So if there is somebody that is infected, of course, then you have to have a mode by which uh, it is, uh, it's transmitted. Uh, and in the bloodborne pathogen standard, we usually talk about a needle stick or an instrument poke uh, that's contaminated with body fluid. And this one we're talking about, it's, it's the droplets and, and uh, the thing that float in the air when people cough without protecting uh, the people around them, you know, such as you see this, or they cough into their hand like this fella here is, and then put that on some kind of a surface where the, the virus can survive uh, or shake hands with somebody that's not infected. And then, of course, if that happens, then you've been warned not to touch your, your eyes, your nose, your mouth, uh, because that's how the virus enters into your system. And of course, then, obviously, you have to have somebody that we call susceptible. And what that means is that somebody uh, that isn't infected, that doesn't have some kind of uh, protection, like with hepatitis B, you would be protected with the, with the vaccine. We don't have that now. We probably will, uh, and we're hopeful because there are signs that we will. We're going to have antibody testing, all of that before very long. Uh, the vaccine is going to take longer. So if that chain goes on, uh, then all of you got, you know, the susceptible host is infected, and that whole thing goes. All you have to do is remove any one of those. And the more that you remove, if you can remove the source, or remove the the mode or uh, by, you know, uh, coughing using the proper, what they call cough etiquette now, or don't touch your face, all of those things, the more of those pieces of chain, the links that you can uh, eliminate, the greater the possibility is, or the probability is that you won't be infected. Um, and so infection control basically, basics, uh, and these are just kind of a, the things we're talking about right now, uh, adhere to the standard precautions. Uh, it used to be that we call universal precautions, but in 2003, uh, the CDC, as in their message to the dental care workers, replaced the uni uh, universal precautions with standard precautions, uh, and that's what we follow now. Uh, implement the transmission-based uh, kind of uh, precautions if you if you can, which is talking about you know the placement of patients, the staying apart from each other. Uh, wearing personal protective equipment appro appropriately, limit the things that uh, can transfer, you know, uh, or transmit uh, the, uh, the virus, like things that people touch and hold on. Follow the WISHA engineering and workplace controls. If you've looked at the OSHA uh, or the WISHA uh, websites late, lately, what they're saying is follow uh, mostly engineering work, work controls and workplace controls. We'll talk about those specifically a little later. And then, of course, implement both the ADA and the CDC interim protocols. And remember, and this is one of the things that a lot of people are concerned about, is that everything that they're being recommended now is going to carry on forever. Uh, the word interim uh, is in all of the CDC conversations. Uh, because they haven't changed recommendations for the long term yet, uh, and they won't uh, for a lot of them. Uh, interim suggests there's a start point and an end point. And remember, we are in that interim period as it applies uh, to uh, protecting yourself and following the guidelines uh, for infection control. I mentioned standard precautions. Standard precautions is the minimum concept or the concept uh, of, whoops, I, I hit that thing, I apologize. Uh, the minimum infection prevention practices that you can do. And, and without going through all the word, it basically is you treat everybody as if they are infected uh, with the exception uh, of uh, human sweat. Universal precautions by comparison that was part of the bloodborne pathogen standard, standard initially was that you treat everybody uh, as if they uh, are infection. Uh, and we're talking about blood and blood products. Standard precautions are talking about all body fluids, not just blood and blood products, uh, as it is with the universal precautions. And on the top of every infection control program, whether it's discussion or whether it is uh, a written program uh, that you're going to ultimately have to have, by the way, in the state of Washington, uh, is hand hygiene. Uh, and, and it's really important to understand that proper hand hygiene is absolutely the most clinic, uh, most critical uh, element in any infection control program. Uh, and the uh, ADA said a few years ago, and this has been a while back, 
uh, that as many as one in five, 20% uh, of the clinical staff neglect to wash their hands between patients. As I said earlier, we go in between 12 and 14, 1,500 uh, offices a year, and we know that that's not a current percentage because we can see that as many as eight out of 10 clinical staff don't uh, wash or disinfect their hands between patients. The requirement is that you uh, clean your hands uh, if they're visibly soiled with soap and water, or if they're not uh, with the uh, uh, alcohol-based hand rubs before you put on your gloves uh, and when you take them off. Clinical or, or staff in, in dentistry is religious about cleaning their hands. We see uh, when they put on gloves going into procedure, but we see very high percentage uh, after procedure don't clean their hands. They might even put on other gloves, but they don't clean their hands uh, before or after they take the gloves off. And it's really important that you do that. And there are a couple of excuses. One is we just don't have time. And besides, I'm going to clean them before we go into the next patient. Neither one of those are, ex are, are acceptable. So uh, this thing is changing by itself. I apologize. Um, so why is uh, uh, hand hygiene so important? Because it's the most common mode that pathogens are transmitted. It's transmitted from patient to staff, when staff covered hand stuff that, uh, I beg your pardon, that handles stuff uh, that is contaminated, if you touch stuff, uh, in, in, inadequate hand antisepsis. Uh, if you don't clean your hands like you should, uh, then you're going to run into problems as, all, as well. And of course, when that happens, you get it from patient to staff and all the way back to patient or to other staff members as well. Hand hygiene uh, needs the it really important that you go through this when you come to work, when they're visibly dirty, after touching any kind of a contaminated object, object with your bare hands, and then before and after patient treatment, and then before you go home. Uh, don't walk out of the office or head in the home uh, with hands that uh, should have been clean before you open the door to leave the facility. One of my favorite things that I've seen written, and this is a number of years ago, where a guy in England, Sir John Owen, said that not having clean operatories and not washing your hands is the clinical equivalent of drunk driving. It maims and it kills. And we absolutely know with this COVID uh, situation that that's true. It is the responsibility of the individual, of the healthcare and the dental care professional. So that's something to remember before you go into treatment, before you put your gloves on, and after you're done. When hands are again are visibly dirty, use soap and water, warm soap and water. If they're not, then you can use uh, the alcohol-based hand rubs. This is a poster that we put together that we're talking about the process that you should go through uh, when you're washing your hands, uh, or if you're going to be using an alcohol-based hand rub. The first thing is to remember to lather up good with the soap or the hand rub, uh, and, and make sure that your whole hand is covered make sure that you do the palm to palm. A lot of people forget to wash the thumb and to wash the palm. I had a people say, oh, I've always washed my hand, but I haven't ever really kind of concentrated on the palms or the thumbs. Think about what you're doing when you're grasping or holding things. Then the back of the hands is equally important uh, and under the fingernails uh, and, and under rings that you might be wearing. Uh, clean it completely and you can see how to do that without a brush if you have a brush great uh, and then of course clean the fingers and I do this one by one uh, and then uh, you know and that's an important kind of thing and that's the full kind of scenario in washing uh, or cleaning your hands and they talk about singing happy birthday to yourself uh, and I think everybody in the country pretty much got the words to that song down uh, as now and there maybe there are other songs that they've been using as well and then when you're done of course you rinse your hands and you're drying and that as you see right there that's the, the hand hygiene uh, that uh, we have made for our clients and if you'd like a copy of that just send it to uh, agd-covid at Harris Biomedical and we will send you all the hand uh, the posters that we're talking about as well. Under fingernails we go into a little more detail uh, on this and I, the remove the rings and watches. And the reason for that is, and usually this is a thing with the ladies, if you have uh, sharp uh, uh, 
jewelry, uh, there's a high risk or high possibility that that's going to puncture uh, the, uh, the gloves that you're wearing. Uh, use nail cleaner if you got it and dry thoroughly before. Uh, and then also remember uh, that short nails are a lot easier to clean than uh, uh, the longer nails. And artificial nails can absolutely uh, harbor pathogens or carry the bad stuff you know, on the underside. And they really should be avoided if at all possible. Now, this is one of the reasons my wife would never be able to work in the, uh, in the dental industry. But if you take a look at, at artificial nails, on the top they're nice and they're smooth and, and they're, they're really, really nice. Uh, but if you turn those over, you can see the underside is extremely porous. And it's almost impossible uh, to clean those appropriately uh, regardless of how hard you try, uh, if you have the artificial nails. And then, you know, the ger German or jewelry, uh, not Germans, jewelry, uh, and hand uh, on your hands or arms uh, can obviously increase the likelihood. And so when we're talking about hand washing, there are a couple of three definitions. Uh, when you're just talking hand washing, it's regular plain soap and water, or with an antiseptic hand wash, some kind of a uh, uh, detergent that contains an antiseptic agent or an alcohol-based hand rub and we have those of course in a variety of ways whether it's wall mounted or in jars or pump bottles or whatever it is and this is a, a sign that we used a long time ago and I just went on the CDC uh, a couple of days ago to make sure it's still there and the idea is that plain soap and water is good uh, antimicrobial soap uh, is, is better but the alcohol-based hand rubs are absolutely best when the hands aren't visibly soiled. And we tell our clients, on the one hand, you're washing the stuff away, and on the other hand, of course, you're killing uh, the, that bacteria or the virus that, that might be lodged there. The CDC recommends that the high, as I just said, are the best method, uh, especially if uh, they're not, uh, if they're not uh, visibly soiled. And just to kind of go over that again, the first thing in the morning before you don the gloves, I am so sorry, I apologize for that hopping back and forth. Uh, before you put your gloves on, as soon as pop possible, after you take it off, and then uh, immediately after the gloves and before you take off, and, and, and not just for you know, taking off for, for home at the end of the day, but also before you leave the clinical area into the non-clinical areas as well. One of the things that is fairly new to a lot of people uh, and, and this is a, a, a picture that I found that pretty much explains kind of what we're going through in a lot of cases here. Uh, it is called respiratory hand or hygiene. Uh, and it's talk about or called cough and sneeze etiquette. And the idea is that uh, you want to make sure that if you do sneeze or cough, uh, that you don't contaminate anybody around you or the area that, that you're in. And that's why we said earlier, uh, that uh, that you provide the tissues for, for the patients as they, they, they come in, uh, provide also, of course, a non-touch receptacle, a waste can or basket that they can throw that stuff in. Uh, let them know for sure if they have to go into the restroom and have tissues in there. If they don't have a mask, especially to copying patients, uh, give them a mask. And then, of course, if you can, uh, if anybody is ill, provide that spacing. Uh, that we talk about for social distancing and or uh, if you have a room that somebody can sit and wait until they go into uh, the procedure such as a, uh, you know a, a consult room that you can place that the patient in and then of course you disinfect both the room and the area they are in uh, once they leave that area and this is a poster that we've put together again uh, for coughing and sneezing uh, if you'd like to have a copy of that, just send us an email. We've given you that address several times and we will again. But it kind of gives you an idea that if you have this up, this isn't just some mimeograph kind of thing. It shows not only the detail, but it lets your patients know uh, by the little pictures up in the corner that you're talking to them as well and you have their concern uh, at, at, uh, in front of you as, uh, as well. Dental unit water quality. This is one of the items that you remember uh, that was in the DQAC or Dental Quality Assurance Commission's new infection control rules. Uh, and it has uh, an effective date of sometime, I think, in January of 2000 or December of 2021, if everything goes according to the 
the, the schedule they have in place right now. But it's really important uh, that you, uh, you follow that, especially now. And the rule and the regulation in the United States is that dental offices are required uh, to meet the EPA standard for drinking water of less than 500 CFU colony forming units uh, of heterotrophic bacteria. And that is three hundredths of one ounce. Uh, and we are not um, experts in dental unit water quality at all. So we contacted uh, a company that we know that is in that uh, and the uh, company that is called ProEdge. Uh, and they said that that in, during this shutdown, here are different things that happen. The, the uh, shutdown has caused, you know, uh, very increased stagnation within the water lines if they weren't shut down in particular, or if they weren't closed. That stagnation leads, obviously, to increased biofilm that's going to develop within those water lines. And the biofilm, you know, is uh, in an environment where they breed among, they breed themselves, basically. Uh, and uh, uh, they cause the real problem that you that you face with the water lines that just aren't uh, clean enough to operate and still provide water at 500 CFU. So you need to have a protocol protocol in place. And so we asked them, and they sent us this. Said that there's a place you can go at free uh, to ProEdge uh, to learn how to shock if you don't know already. Uh, learn how often to shock by testing and then ultimately having drinkable water. Uh, and their point is that when you come back, shock all your water lines, including the air water uh, syringes, the hand pieces, the ultrasonic scalers, uh, and it doesn't matter what treatment you use uh, as long as you do it. And they also point out, don't ever shock uh, uh, through a straw product, uh, call ProEdge uh, or the manufacturer uh, so that you can understand how to do that. They also have a, uh, that form that you see to the left that they provide you. Uh, and if you want to contact them, and this is not a, a commercial for them at all. Uh, I just happen to know who they are at ProEdgeDental.com. Uh, and they will provide you uh, or answer any questions you might have specific to your particular setup. And then, of course, test the system, ensure the biofilm uh, is uh, that's development during has been completely cleaned out uh, and gone back to a minimum uh, of 500 CFU per milliliter. Uh, and one of the things that, that we all know is that the dental units cannot reliably uh, per, to, uh, be produced uh, and, and maintain uh, that uh, 500 CFU requirement. Uh, and just to kind of run through real quickly, this is what uh, the biofilm can look like uh, at 500 uh, or basically inside a, a water line. And because the line is so small and because it's on and off, it, it's not running through all the time so it can self-clean, uh, this stuff builds up. And this shows you what that same thing when we talk about biofilm, kind of what it is uh, and what happens if you, you clean the water. So if you take, and, and that's obviously an outside comparison, but I think you get the drift of what we're talking about here. And so if you're talking about this being at 500 uh, or less, and then you wait uh, up four or five days, that same stuff looks like this. And these are pictures, these aren't drawings. And I don't care how you cut this one, uh, I just soon not have that in my mouth. And I'm sure you wouldn't want it in your patient's mouth, nor would they want it at all. And that is absolutely the importance of, of cleaning it. And like I say, they're in small bore tubes. Uh, it, man, it magnifies and grows at you know, a, a tremendous rate. Uh, and, and it is uh, uh, carrying, and it's in the source of, of uh, municipal, municipal water supply. And that's why you have to go through that process. And here's an example, how long, and I'll just go through this real quickly, did it take uh, for this biofilm layer that you see there to develop, you know, three day, three weeks, the answer. And all of that was in there. And that, that's obviously a, an, a, an example of magnification, but, but it's there. So talk to your supplier, uh, independent, uh, talk about independent uh, issues that you have, the setup that you have, the treatment you're using or need, uh, and talk to a pro on this. Uh, but the main thing is, uh, that you absolutely don't want to go through this and just pick up and start running without making sure that the water lines 
uh, are clean. And so shock that system as you go in uh, and uh, make sure that they're clean before you go out. So what is the risk? How great is it? Uh, ProEdge gave us this information. They did a uh, study of 22,000 real life, real time water lines. And out of those 22,000 water lines, oh, just under a third failed to meet the 500 CFU and over 60% had at least one water line in the system that failed. So it happens sometimes regardless of how hard you try. How great is the risk to the patient? You might remember uh, that uh, a couple of years ago, uh, we call it the uh, Anaheim situation, where there was a company, let me just see if this goes back, uh, in, in called uh, Children's Dental Group in Anaheim. In 2016, they found that over a bunch of kids in that uh, had gone to the offices in that dental group, had gone in and they had, uh, they had a serious uh, infection, uh, abscess infection because from the pulpotomy. Uh, 71 children they found out. The way they found out is a, one of the children went to a physician because of the infection in her mouth uh, and the doctor thought that was peculiar. He hadn't seen that for a while. And then shortly after that, another patient came in, child, uh, to the same doctor and another one after that. Uh, and so the doctor looked in and found out that he had 71 kids uh, that uh, had uh, been infected in that particular group of dental offices uh, in ages 2 to 11. 99%, uh, all but one of the kids uh, were hospitalized. 26 had more than one surgery and 45 lost permanent teeth, all because of the water lines uh, that had not been flushed uh, as or cleaned as they should have been. So you just flat don't want to, I am so sorry about that. You just flat want to make sure that you monitor regularly uh, closed sy systems. And again, what we talked about, a checklist are susceptible. Uh, germ germicidal treatment is effective. Engineering to attraction prevention is effective. Uh, but uh, follow the manufacturer's instruction and train the employees on any methods that you might implement so that it's done uh, as it should be done. So that was, we now talk about OSHA. I've talked about the connection between OSHA and WSHA in uh, the state of Washington, but OSHA has not adopted any rules specific to uh, COVID-19. I mentioned that earlier, uh, but we've had people call and said, we know that OSHA is now t requiring certain things. Uh, different states, if they have state programs, can uh, up the ante, if you will, uh, as it relates to their own state. But across the board, federal OSHA has not uh, made any changes. They've made some recommendations that we're going to talk about in a second. Uh, but uh, the state of Washington also hasn't made any changes at all. Uh, OSHA has outlined, outlined what they call major recommendations with the asterisk that these are not uh, changes to the regulation, but they're recommending uh, that you practice good hygiene, you maintain the social distancing, uh, in, whether at work uh, or certainly within the public, and, and eliminate any unnecessary interaction with co-workers uh, and the public. Uh, and from the OSHA's perspective, that's what's in place, protect the employees. Of course, we talked about the CDC, they're concerned more about uh, the infection control for the public. OSHA goes on to say, and they defer to the CDC, uh, and we go over this again, and we've talked about it a couple times, promote uh, frequent hand washing. Uh, and, you know, after every patient, after you take your gloves off, before you put your gloves on, those kinds of things. Encourage uh, with the signs or with communication, verbal communication, uh, or talking to your patients or talking to each other, respiratory etiquette. Uh, provide patients with the tissues. Stagger, if you can, uh, the work schedule, you know, or the patient appointment so that one isn't on top, what they call stacking uh, the schedule. Uh, if you can, uh, stagger the work hours. Uh, and that can work to the benefit of both your staff as well as to the patients as well. Uh, don't use other people's phones. Don't use their desks or their equipment. Uh, again, go back to uh, the second and third one up there, you know, hand washing is the key to this and maintain regular housekeeping practices. Don't skip any of them uh, that you might otherwise if you weren't uh, concerned about the COVID issue. 
in Washington, it's not just WISHA anymore. And this has been going on for quite a while. Our comment is it's WISHA and infection control because OSHA will cite people uh, as it relates to not following OSHA guidelines if it puts employees at risk. And it uses the 2003 and the 2008 infection control guidelines as what they call standards of practice. Uh, and, and you have to follow that. Uh, and if you don't, uh, and uh, employees become injured or at risk, even though it's an infection control issue, usually into the house of the CDC because you're endangering employees, uh, OSHA, and in our state, WISHA, uh, can and will uh, cite people for not following those protective rules uh, for your employees. Uh, and in the Bloodborne Pathogen Standard, it says you must document the infection control system used to protect employees from exposure. And that's why when we write the OSHA programs for our clients, we have a full infection control uh, program based on the CDC guidelines uh, for them to protect themselves and their, their patients. Of course, you, you know, uh, use standard precautions, integrate and, and, and what standard precautions do uh, is, as I mentioned earlier, it, it doesn't just take the place of universal precautions and it sounds like you're kind of going you know down the, the ladder from universal to standard but it really is an expansion of universal precautions and the basic one-liner on that is that you consider all body fluids secretions and excretions except human sweat and i don't know why that's the case uh, whether or not they can contain body fluids uh, and or, or contain blood when we talk about WISHA, we can still talk about the bloodborne pathogen standard as the guideline because that's what OSHA tells you is to follow the bloodborne pathogen standard uh, because that bloodborne pathogen standard is almost solely based on the guidelines uh, that CDC put out at the time and is updated. Uh, continue the primary control programs that you use administratively, engineering controls, work practice controls. Keep those in place because they not only protect against bloodborne in almost all cases or many cases it protects against airborne or airborne and certainly it helps in the issues that we're talking about in dealing and protecting against uh, COVID. Uh, administrative, what do you do in, in that? You know, teledentistry is a good way to do a lot of things such as the pre-screening, such as calling back, you know, for the post-screening, making sure people, anything that you can do uh, in the administrative side uh, via telephone uh, is perfect if you can communicate, you know, with your patients so they don't have to come in and spend time uh, talking to staff at the counter. Uh, scheduling triage, you know, make sure if you can do the best when you're scheduling, uh, take the most important, as we're talking about right now, I say important, the more serious, uh, if it's emergency or urgent, before you would take, uh, once you can, uh, the standard normal non-essential um, uh, kinds of training. Uh, make sure that the staff understands, you know, uh, what their requirements are in terms of personal protective equipment, including that we'll talk about in a few minutes, using the N95. On interim protocols, make sure that you understand now what you're supposed to do. And we've talked about some of the stuff already and we'll continue. Uh, remember these are interim. Uh, and at some point it'll go back to normal, we hope. Uh, there, I suspect, will be some changes. I don't think some of them are going to be as drastic uh, as, as we've heard uh, from a lot of people. Uh, and just from an administrative point of view, kind of make sure the supply and the process and the program is going along as it should. In terms of engineering controls that are basically designed to either isolate or remove the hazard, uh, personal protective equipment. I won't beat that horse anymore, but you need to wear it because I'm going to talk about it a little more in a minute. Uh, but you need to wear the personal protective equipment to protect yourself and to protect your patients. Dispose of sharps in the containers, in the operatories, which is what is required uh, by OSHA and by WISHA. If there are safer devices to use that will cut down any risk to the patients, uh, pardon me, to the employees, as well as the patients, now's the time to do that. And you know better than I, you know, what devices we're talking about in your operatory. And in terms of work practice controls, social distancing applies not just from you and your patients, but also from your, your working mates. Um, that doesn't mean necessarily that, that you can't talk to each other, but if you can, you know, keep that distance 
uh, from each other. Uh, in the pre-screening, you know, talk about uh, the things that uh, you would you would do. And, and when we talk about work practice control, you know, teledentistry is one of the things. Use appropriate personal protective equipment. Uh, and the one thing that I always tell people, don't use shortcuts. Um, you know, people use shortcuts to make up time. They use shortcuts for a variety of reasons. But if you just think about it for a more moment, ultimately a shortcut is going to get somebody hurt or somebody in trouble. If the way to do it was a shortcut, it wouldn't be called a shortcut. And that's not the way that you were taught. Personal protective equipment. Anytime there's a reasonable likelihood that blood or any body fluid is going to reach your skin or your clothing, you must wear personal protective equipment uh, and it must be appropriate to the challenge of the procedure. Uh, that means gloves. And when we talk about gloves, you have the single use items. Once removed, they must be discarded. And we're still talking about that. Uh, that's, uh, the, that's not anything new. Uh, and uh, there are, of course, different kinds of gloves. You have the examination or the chair side gloves. Very often, in a lot, we see the nitrile more often than not uh, nowadays that are chair side. That can also be used in some of uh, the uh, disinfecting processes. But the utility glove is what uh, is required, recommended by the CDC, and required under WISHA uh, and OSHA standards. It doesn't have to be this gauntlet type. You can get to uh, you know, like the dishwashing gloves that are form fitting in different sizes. Uh, you don't have to throw these away after a single use, of course, but if they come, become compromised in any way, uh, then of course a hole or a slit or a cut or a crack, then you throw those away. But always disinfect and we always recommend uh, that you use an underglove uh, when you wear the utility gloves as well. In all exposure potential, the glove, again, uh, where you would remove it after patient care and put on a new pair for the next patient, or if it is in, you know, the utility room where you can use it uh, and then clean it or disinfect it after you use it. And that's an important thing. And we're talking every time you, that you use it. And of course, you don't uh, wear gloves that are compromised or torn, and you don't wash or, or clean the gloves either. And we're talking again, chair side or clinical gloves. You can certainly wash utility gloves and reuse them as well. <clears throat> Face masks is probably the one question that, that we get more often than not. Uh, and whether it's a face mask or a respirator uh, and the CDC has certain uh, recommendations and they've altered certain things. We'll talk about it, especially with the N95 mask. We know that the uh, supply is really cut back uh, here's just a thing, and we've got this. We'd be glad to send, put to get, or send you a copy of that basically told, tells you the difference between a level one, a level two, uh, and a level three mask, between low barrier and high barrier, uh, and the uh, uh, comparison to uh, an K, or pardon me, an N95, and then there's a K. N95 that is, I think, made in Korea or someplace that until now hasn't been uh, accepted in the United States. It's been cleared uh, as an interim project or a pro situation uh, for response and for supply uh, of use of masks uh, during this interim case. But this is something, if you want a copy of it, we'll be glad to send that to you as well. But it explains the differences the degree to which you'll be protected, and the differences, of course, with everything. And a requirement for both CDC and masks, or an N95, or if you don't have an N95, some equivalent uh, can be used uh, for all exposure potential procedures. And I've seen where people have used, you know, uh, an N95, uh, or pardon me, use a, a regular mask over the N95 uh, to, uh, extend the life of the use of the N95. Uh, and that means that, you know, in those kind of things, uh, obviously you would still discard the mask or the N95 if it's soiled or damaged. And with the N95, we'll get to that in a second, especially if it's damaged and can't give the protection it needs. Uh, but it's really important uh, that the, 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 whatever you're using uh, doesn't restrict the breathing uh, and it doesn't put you at risk uh, when you're in procedures where exposure is potential. In other words, change the masks, and this is something you will carry on uh, unless we're talking about 
uh, the M95 that we'll, we'll discuss here in a second uh, between each patient. As it relates to it, the one thing that you have to remember about the M95 is that it has a regulation all its own, uh, both in the state of Washington and in other states as well. It doesn't fall under the standard mask use. Uh, and without getting into a lot of the detail, one, uh, you have to have a fit. Uh, every person that wears the M95 mask has to have it form fitted uh, by a professional. That particular requirement has been shelved during this interim basis, but you still, still have to have a seal fit. In other words, make sure that it fits around everybody uh, that has a single use uh, connection to it. But for the most part, uh, the, uh, and one other thing, it has to have a separate training uh, regimen for your employees. It has to have a set and separate written program. All of those things have been set aside right now during the interim uh, issue to be able to provide uh, breathing uh, safety uh, for employees. So when we talk about it, the CDC and uh, the American Dental Association say to use the highest level of personal protective equipment available when treating patients to review, reduce the risk of exposure. Initially, they were talking about those who were infected or in fact had uh, the disease. That's been relieved. And it says now whether they are using, whether they are with patient or, or with the symptoms or not, uh, go ahead and use the N95, assuming that you have it. Uh, if you don't have it, you know, the level three, if you have that, uh, but whatever you come up with, you don't want to go into those procedures without some kind of, of face protection. Fit te testing, as I said, has been uh, temporarily released, but you still must make sure that you seal check every time the mask is worn. And ideally, you know, after each use uh, where it, uh, aerosol is generated, you would get rid of it. You don't have to do that now. But the one thing to remember, and it says you can wear the N95 mask for more than one uh, patient, uh, even if it does become contaminated. But you have to remember a couple of things. First is don't touch the mask uh, with uh, or the, either the mask or don't touch the respirator with your gloves because that's going to contaminate it again and obviously the longer you wear it it's going to somehow uh, or ultimately it's going to uh, interrupt your ability to breathe appropriately so use general common sense on that but if you're going to use it remember that you don't touch your face and you can and you don't take it off between patients you wear it all time uh, and those are the rules basically go ahead and wear it uh, for more than one don't touch it don't take it off uh, unless you're done uh, for that time. And that once that's done, uh, then you can discard it. And there's a call, and, and this is what we're kind of talking about, extended use. Uh, make sure that, that if you're going to use it uh, for extended or going to reuse it, uh, make sure that it's structurally uh, sound and if the, if the structure, and it can't provide the train or the safety uh, and the protection that's need, discard it. Make sure that it's still functional uh, that meaning you can breathe on the one hand and that it's not letting it bad stuff in on the other hand. And they make sure that the filter material isn't damaged or soiled or contaminated with blood. In any of those situations, if there's a negative, then you dump the thing and get a new one. Uh, and one of the thing also for extended reuse, uh, you can use the N95 if it has an expired date. Uh, and employees, you, if you're going to provide, if the doctor provides uh, the N95 with an expired date on it, employees have to know that uh, so that uh, it's, you're probably still going to have, you know, the same benefit of protection. Uh, but there's a reason that there is an expired date. But for this interim period, the CDC and OSHA uh, will both allow reuse of, the, uh, use of that or reuse, even though it might have uh, of an expired date. Uh, and the other thing, it must not be used on infected or potentially infected COVID-19 patients if it does have an expired date on it. And that's an important thing to remember as well. Uh, and the users, uh, just a reminder, if you're going to use one uh, or reuse one, uh, make sure that you perform that seal check every time. And if it doesn't seal, if it, if it fails to provide the seal uh, that you need to protect yourself, then do not use that respirator. 
uh, and then the staff, of course, has to be known how to, it's important to know how to don or doff uh, the respirator. And I think it's an easy thing uh, Will in my office pointed out, uh, don and doff aren't words that a lot of people use, but if you just drop the D on don, that means how you put it on, and you drop the D on doff, and then you can take, that's when you take it off. So I think that's a good little thing there. And of course, that is from OSHA as well. In terms of protective eyewear, and I'm talking really quickly so we can get through this and get to some of the questions. Uh, wear glasses, goggles, or a full face shield. And of course, if you wear the face shield, you must still wear the mask. Uh, disinfect the eye protection uh, between patients. And this is the OSHA stuff. And remember in the state of Washington, one of the current uh, disin or infection control rules is that you must offer your patients eye protection as well. Uh, and I would on this one just insist that they do. You know, you're protecting them from their own, uh, their own body fluids, but stuff flies around. Uh, and uh, I kind of always jokingly said that the people that insist not to wear uh, eye protection probably have their attorney on speed dial. So uh, that's uh, maybe more true than not. But clean that eyewear, yours and theirs, between each patient. And you can use soap and water to do that. It doesn't have to, be, have to be a disinfectant. Years ago, one of my clients said that, you know, this personal protective equipment uh, thing is getting, really getting out of hand. And this was in 1993. So we had this cartoon made by a professional along with some others. <clears throat> and uh, it was on, and they, these cartoons are on uh, YouTube and a lot of places. Uh, but nowadays, this same conversation is coming up and when people are telling other people, yep, we heard that we're going to have to wear a complete suit, a, a, like a moon suit now, you know, a body zips up the front. There's nothing in the regulation that says that. There's nothing that CDC or OSHA have produced that said that that's going to happen uh, in the field of dentistry. In other fields, in more serious medical sites, uh, that happens, you know, now. Uh, but in dentistry, uh, that doesn't apply. And it goes back to what I said earlier. Remember the CDC guidelines apply to medicine that we're using, apply to medicine and dentistry. So you have to sift out. Uh, as my dad, I grew up on a farm in Wyoming, used to say, uh, to get to what you need to do, you have to sift out the fly specks from the pepper. And that's what you have to do as a professional in dentistry. Sift out those medically oriented types of recommendations or requirements from the dental side and you have a better hand on what you have to do. But you must wear appropriate personal, what we call an overgarment. It can be a knee-length lab coat. We see that a lot more in the dental setting. Uh, it can be thigh or waist-length lab jackets with uh, scrub pants or disposable lab coats. It really doesn't matter what personal protective equipment they're to use, but remember that personal protective equipment is to protect the employee from exposure uh, to uh, the, the viruses or to any kind of, uh, of uh, spattering, splashing, aerosoling. Uh, and that, when we talk about the, the overgarment, it's usually, usually spattering and splashing. Uh, so it doesn't matter what you wear as long as you have an appropriate uh, uh, gown or appropriate personal protective equipment. And basically appropriate means uh, that we, the, the, you, uh, it, re, it responds to the challenge of whatever procedure you're in. Uh, if it becomes soiled, visibly soiled, uh, just a matter of PR, you might want to change it then as well. Discard the soiled garment, garment into you know, a hamper of all its own, away from other stuff. And then this is a line that has a lot of controversy, a lot of confusion. It says cloth garments should be laundered after each use. That doesn't say after each patient. That says after each use. And you'll notice when you're talking about the, the masks, they're talking about the eye protection being cleaned after each patient. If the garment is soiled, then you take it off and get a different garment. But after each use, not it doesn't say after each patient. That means unless it is visibly soiled, no longer uh, than the end of the day. Uh, and that is pretty much what you, you're doing right now. Uh, I had one office call and said, if we have to change after every patient, even if it's disposable, that's going to be over $100 a day, uh, and that's not what is, is called for in, in this particular uh, CDC interim period. This is one of the other uh, issues that we had. 
Uh, so we talk about sterilization. Uh, again, we talk about water quality uh, uh, and you have to maintain that. But in terms of environmental uh, disinfection and cleaning, use the old spray wipe spray method, method if you're still using it, spray the cleaner on it, then wipe that clean because it the disinfectant has to be applied to a clean surface. So you spray it, you leave it, you wipe it clean and you spray it and allow it to dry. We get the question, how long do I have to leave it on? Whatever the manufacturer's established kill time is, if it's one minute, two minutes, 10 minutes, that's how long it should be wet until it dries. If you're using the wipes, then you instead of spray, wipe, spray, you wipe, discard that wipe to be used to clean and use other wipe or wipes in both of the scenarios uh, to put the disinfectant down. Uh, you should also have in the processing, you know, the clean to dirty. You don't have to have a line on the counter or a sign on one side of, that says clean, one side that says dirty. But this is kind of the process that we talk about. You have an area like you see on the left uh, where the stuff comes in and notice the sinks there, the ultrasonics there, this is where you would leave the dirty trays. And they are, that's where you do the cleaning. And then you take that in and you prepare, you know, for the packaging or put them in the pouch or whatever it is uh, that you prepare, you know, whether it's cassettes that are wrapped or pouches or packages, uh, it's required that you put them in a pouch and not single use unless it's a, an emergency kind of situation. Uh, to be sterilized. It goes into the sterilization uh, or into the sterilizer. Remember, don't open those doors until it says that the drying cycle is complete and then you store them out of the way so that uh, you have that uh, complete. They're not in a damp or a wet area so the instruments are maintained in a sterile uh, situation uh, until it comes time for use. So and we got the questions uh, a lot of times uh, we say, and this is a question came up, you know, we haven't used any of these things uh, any of the equipment that we sterilized uh, a month ago, do we have to re-sterilize those? And the answer to that is no, if the sterilizing the package or the wrapping or the bag uh, has is, is still secure, it means it doesn't have a hole in it or a rip or a poke or a tear because the CDC recognizes and OSAP, which is an excellent organization, recognizes that if it's sterile and the sterile barrier hasn't been uh, compromised, then there isn't a lifespan uh, as how long uh, you can keep it in that sterilized container before you use it. So the short answer, do I have to re-sterilize everything, is known. A few years ago, there was a guy a long time ago, if you're older like I am, you remember a guy named John McEnroe. Uh, and he argued just how every time could turn around. Uh, with just about anybody, but in particular the line judges and referees. And one of the things that he yelled that has hung on to this day was when he turned to the one and he was asking some questions uh, about a call. And he yelled at the guy, answer my questions, jerk. And so that's what we're going to do now. Uh, we uh, uh, received, uh, we thought, well, I think I told uh, Dr. Ness it was uh, 50 or 60 uh, I've since found out that we received about 140 different questions uh, or 140 questions that sent to the uh, website that we would set up. Uh, we put those into categories and we'll take these one at a time and get out of here uh, under schedule. Uh, so, and if, if the questions that, uh, if I have it here and we don't answer your question, then send the questions to agd-covid at harrisbiomedical.net. Uh, and we will try to answer each and every one of those separately as well. So one of the first questions, are we required to have a written respiratory prevention plan in our office? And the answer to that is no. Normally you would, and you would have to have one, but the CDC and OSHA uh, both have said that if you're using respirators such as the N95, WISHA's uh, written plan requirement that, like I say, is, is required has been suspended uh, throughout the healthcare industry, not just dentistry, uh, during this COVID interim period uh, pandemic. Are we required to install air filtration and UV lights for disinfection? No, and I will tell you this, I got a call from one of our clients that said a vendor had called him and said, this is a required thing uh, and you're gonna have to have this 
air filtration system and he got a quote of over $20,000 to put that system in. There is no requirement at this time, no recommendation by the CDC and no requirement uh, to dental offices uh, that you have to have it, uh, the system. Uh, as long as you're continuing to observe the standard precautions for disinfection uh, and you're disinfecting adequately, you know, the surfaces you're working in. Uh, and while there are some uh, healthcare settings that might be required to have a positive or a negative room pressure, at this time in dentistry, it is not the case. So if they're trying to sell you something, uh, you don't have to do that. And as a matter of fact, I got a call from uh, one another client here early last week that said they had a, uh, another dentist called uh, asking if they were going to use the same vendor to do some of the things that the CDC was requiring. Remember, as I said earlier, the CDC does not have the authority of law. It, ha it has the authority to recommend and establish guidelines. And once those guidelines are established in the state of Washington, the Dental Quality Assurance Commission would be the body that would ultimately turn that into law if they are in the process of doing that or in inclined to do that. And the CD and DQAC, the Dental uh, Commission in Washington has made the statement, they are not at this time making any changes or recommendations to the infection control rules uh, that they have uh, put forward. And that air filtration is not included in that package in the state of Washington. What precautions should administrative ta take, you know, when we're opening? And I can go over those pretty quickly, uh, but I, pardon me, if, if I just go back to that. Uh, and I talked to him about earlier, but keep an appropriate distance from patients and staff, you know, if you have to talk to them six feet, there is not a requirement that you have a, a plastic barrier like you see uh, uh, in say Safeway or some of the stores at this time. Uh, if you want to wear a, a mask, and I've seen uh, uh, when I went to our dentist, uh, both the receptionist and all the staff members are wearing a mask, uh, make sure that you clean, not just you know the counters, the pens, countertops, uh, computer keyboards, the, the mice <laughs> or your mouses, uh, phones, light switches, door handles, restroom and peripheral sink faucets and the handles, any clipboards, those are the kind of things that you give to patients or you use back and forth. Keep those clean and disinfected. Uh, and then, of course, uh, any of the areas, you know, that we talk about uh, cleaning, that's important as well. And how do you screen the patients when they call? Um, CDC at this time hasn't established, nor has OSHA, establish any particular updated recommendation for the interim setting. Uh, the triage that we mentioned earlier uh, to pick, you know, the emergency or urgent uh, kinds of uh, procedures uh, that you want. But, but the long and the short of it is, is that uh, I, I gave you some questions. Go through those. Don't be timid about asking the various questions uh, and, and continue uh, even when they come in, you know, to use those screening techniques that I talked about either at the front desk or uh, in the operatory as well. <clears throat> How do you screen them when they call? As I pointed out, just going over this real quickly, you know, they've been diagnosed uh, as being infected or do they have the disease? If they've been diagnosed, uh, then have them either self-quarantine or talk to their medical doctor and reschedule at a later date. If they are in fact uh, patients, the same quarantine is determined uh, by their medical physician and you don't see them until they've been cleared uh, and ask them as well, you know, uh, have they have the fever or the cough or the shortness of breath, uh, flu-like symptoms, um, has their sense of taste uh, or, or smell uh, or hearing of any of those senses uh, been challenged lately? Those are the kinds of things that would you ask in a screen. And then uh, in, uh, is taking the temperature in the waiting area compliant with HIPAA uh, or at the chair side? It absolutely is. Uh, and of course, in the chair side, other people are, might not be there, uh, but HIPAA has made it clear that this is one of the things obviously you can do. And you don't have to say it out loud if there are other people, uh, but the, the, you, this is something you can do. Uh, again, if you're going to be doing this, remember the disinfecting processes we talked about as well as if you're going to be doing this in the, uh, in the waiting area uh, with the uh, administrative staff, where are the appropriate uh, personal protective equipment? And as we talked about earlier, uh, you might want to stagger uh, the uh, 
order that the patients come in. If you can uh, set up uh, some kind of a, a distancing situation for chairs and so forth, that would help as well. But as it relates to HIPAA, uh, it's not a problem at this point. Uh, and it says, after disinfecting, how long do we wait to seat the patient? I answered that a little earlier. And the answer to that is, look on whatever the, the container says that the manufacturer uh, has identified as the kill time or the time to let it sit before it dries. Uh, some products, one or two, say a minute. Uh, a lot of products say two minutes. There are products that I've seen that have a longer kill time, but don't use the shortest time possible if the longest, a longer time is recommended uh, by the manufacturer. Do you have to wear uh, the N95 uh, respirator? We've kind of gone through that, but the CDC interim, gui interim guidelines, you know, for treating emergency patients recommend that you use the highest level, like I said a little earlier, of the PEE or PPE available. If it's available, wear the N95 respirator. If it's not available, then use a combination of a surgical mask and a full face shield. Give you just that little extra bit of protection as well. Uh, people have said, can I wear one mask on top of another? Uh, again, as it doesn't impede the breathing and the ability uh, to where you have to breathe harder, uh, then sure that uh, the CDC just hasn't published anything. And so at this time, uh, the answer is uh, no, uh, you don't have to wear uh, the mask. Then the thing came back and people ask, do the employees, can they demand the dentist to provide the N95 respirator? Of course you can be demanded, but the answer is, does the, the real question is, does the employer have to provide that? And the answer is, under the current laws, no. Uh, is the law requires that the employer provides, as I said earlier, and maintain appropriate personal protective equipment uh, per the uh, language that's in the bloodborne pathogen standard, which is copied almost directly from the recommendations of the CDC. And currently, there's not a requirement for the 95, uh, either in the bloodborne pathogen standard or uh, in the CDC uh, recommendations. And even if the recommendation came from the CDC guidelines, until it is made a law, like in the OSHA, or if maybe the you know the, the legislature, the governor said, okay, everybody got to wear that, uh, then it has to go through the process to be adopted. And at this time, it isn't. And according to DQAC, there are no plans that it would be included. How many people, uh, or how can people be fitted uh, for the N95? Uh, in normal conditions, there are a lot of companies, there's several uh, that you get because it's supposed to be done by a professional. Uh, we don't have any uh, specific line to a, any particular company. We know that in the there's a company uh, uh, in the uh, Pacific Northwest that uh, does that. I can't remember the name of it right now. Oh, it's called Northwest Response. Uh, it's a reputable company. Uh, we get <laughs> no perks at all about any part of it uh, by uh, recommending them. And we're just saying that they're available as one that we know. And it says, can a level three mask be modified to form fit if the N95s are unavailable? Uh, and the short answer to that uh, is uh, no. Uh, I, might, I might just go back to that. Uh, there's nothing expressly written that says that uh, you can't uh, modify the level three mask. Uh, a surgical mask simply just can't be modified to match the effectiveness of the N95 uh, because it needs to seal to the face. And it doesn't matter how extensive the, the alteration is or how hard you work at it, a surgical mask just cannot uh, be uh, maneuvered uh, to uh, be equal to the same protection that a, a respirator is going to give you. Again, can you wear two uh, for this, the, the price of one? There's no rule that says one way or the other uh, that uh, uh, you can't wear two. Masks, just remember, it's harder to breathe through it. Uh, but uh, if you can do that and you're comfortable with doing that, uh, there's nothing that says that you can't. The thing to remember right now, though, is there's an extreme shortage of face masks. Uh, and that's a good way uh, to get through whatever supply that you might have. Uh, do you uh, have to change garments between patients? Again, I mentioned that a minute ago. The CDC interim guidelines recommend that you change the gown if it becomes visibly soiled, uh, but it also recommends, and that's consistent with the 
uh, garment requires of the bloodborne pathogen standard, uh, but it says not between patients. It does not mention patients. It says between uses, and uses uh, is basically defined as at the end of the day, unless it's visibly soiled. Will you be required to wear face shields? No, I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, because the current bloodborne pathogen standard uh, says uh, that uh, you have to wear appropriate personal protective equipment and goggles with side shields, glasses with side shields are included right along with face shields as being appropriate uh, for uh, personal protective equipment. Uh, the question then is what's the correct order of donning or doffing? Remember what I said about uh, the shortcuts of seeing which means what uh, and donning and doffing. So when we take in terms of uh, donning uh, the uh, personal protective equipment, you put on the gown, and then the mask or the respirator, and then the goggles, the eyewear or face shield, and then the gloves. And then when we're talking about taking it off, uh, then, uh, and this one seems a little bit interesting to me, uh, but we've seen it on two of the CDC publications. You take the gloves off first, uh, and then you take the goggles, the eyewear, the face shield off, then the gown, and then the mask and the respirator with the key that you need to clean your hands if they become soiled uh, in that process. And my answer to that would be, duh, you know, that's, uh, that only makes common sense uh, from the get-go. And then will the new OSHA, or what will the new OSHA uh, requirements and the requirements be? We don't have a clue this time. We just don't know. I think it's possible that some things will be changed. Uh, I don't expect to see some of the things for dentistry uh, that you're hearing on uh, the various internet conversations, uh, like the air filtration, uh, like one uh, person said that hygienists are going to have to be uh, in closed rooms all their own, even sometimes in different buildings. I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, I do think that some of the stuff will be tweaked. Uh, but it'll all be considered by saner minds as the curve flattens out and we get closer to, to what are kind of normal. Uh, the one thing that I just tell people, you know, any time that you start making decisions during what we call the panic part of, of the process uh, is ultimately going to be to the disbenefit of a whole lot of people. And that's why we say stick to the CDC guidelines. Remember, they are interim meaning there's a start and a finish to this. Uh, so the stuff might be changed, uh, but at this point, other than what we've talked about, there's no indication uh, that either the CDC or issue or, or, or uh, uh, OSHA or WISHA are gonna make any significant changes. I promise you, if they do, uh, we will let you know, our clients, we let them know, of course, and we always have uh, that line open as well. So we are right now out of time. Uh, I thank you. I thank the AGD for asking. We will try to answer any questions we can that haven't been included. We'll be again, I think it's next Wednesday at 2.30 if people didn't get to see this. Uh, and so I'd like to say right now, we're done. Thank you much. Go wash your hands. Thank you very much, Terry. Appreciate it. Uh, you know, there was a lot of information. There's there's a ton of questions, 126 questions in the Q&A. Uh, we had all kinds of questions in the chat. So people, uh, we're going to be doing this next Wednesday. And so if you have questions, so Terry can boil them down again into some categories. It's agd-covid at harrisbiomedical.net that's appeared many a time over in the chat side there. Uh, Dr. Hamoto, would you type that in again for us there? Um, a reminder, you can register for upcoming webinars at washingtonagd.org. We apologize to uh, some of you out there, uh, staff members, etc., that could not get on this webinar today. Uh, we have a Zoom account, uh, and we only have a limited number of people that are able to get on, and we, we crashed through that today. And quite frankly, we just don't have the financial resources to expand out what we're doing at this time. So uh, sorry for that. Uh, Later today, this webinar will be available at YouTube. So go to YouTube, Washington Academy of General Dentistry. Um, 
Terry, I think what we should do is we because we've got all these attendees and the, the registered uh, people that have registered. Uh, I think we should probably just put an email package together with the you know PDFs of things and that that everybody was asking about. And we'll fire them out uh, to all those email addresses we have. For those of you that were asking about CE credits, uh, codes, all that, there's no codes. Uh, the Zoom picks up automatically how long you were on the uh, webinar today. The University of Washington School of Dentistry will be sending you CE credit to the email address you registered at. Uh, and that should be coming in two to three days. Uh, and for those of you that are AGD members, your CE credits will be turned into the Academy of General Dentistry. Those will show up on your transcript within two to four weeks. Just a reminder, at noon today, we've got Penny Reed coming up uh, with her topic, driving case acceptance, be more like Disney and less like the IRS. And then to end our day off, we have Dr. Roy Shelburne, uh, with his presentation, Do Dentistry, Not Prison Time, Clinical Records Prevent Criminal Records. With that, Terry, thank you again. Greatly appreciated and uh, look forward to seeing you next week, sir. All right, thank Mel. You. Thank you.